And good afternoon. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this Daily Maverick webinar. I am Ray Mashaka, and I am with the Daily Maverick. Um, uh, we'll be featuring Nick Haralambus. I mean, he is an accomplished entrepreneur. He's an overachiever, as I told him earlier in our discussion. He recently wrote a book, this book, How to Start a Side Hustle. Here we go. Now, we spoke to Nick back in April 2020, I think, about the book. Um, at the time, it was an electronic book, but Nick decided to add more to the book, and it is now a physical book, uh, and it's in a physical book format. Um, so we're hoping to talk, we'll be talking to him about the book. And uh, this webinar is sponsored by e-commerce day. Uh, the inaugural e-commerce day will take place on the 10th of March. So next week, and uh, to grow the local e-commerce sector, some of the biggest players in the industry are banding together to help local entrepreneurs uh, start or expand their e-commerce uh, business. But uh, Nick, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us again. Hey, Ray. Thanks for having me. Usually appreciate it. Absolutely. Congratulations on the book again. I feel like I'm a broken record. Should I congratulate you this time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, a real physical book in the world is an achievement. <laughs> So, Nick, it's always a bad place to assume that people know what you're talking about when you talk about a side hustle. Um, maybe can we start there to just to you know just elaborate what we're talking about when you when you talk about a side hustle and what it means actually. Sure, it is a really important start point, um, and it's different for everybody. But in my world, in this book, I'm talking about things you do on the side that add to your existing income stream. It's not to be mistaken for a startup where you're writing a business plan. Please don't write a business plan. And you're going to go out and raise millions of dollars to build this business and work 20 hours a day. That is not what I am preaching and what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a small time, a small amount of your efforts that goes to adding income to your existing income stream. That's really as simple as it is for me. Yeah. And we'll talk about your hate for business plans. I mean, Nick writes a lot about this in the book. Um, but I mean, you, you've spent 20 years building businesses, uh, Nick. You could have written about anything uh, and everything. Um, but why specifically side hustles? Um, you know, why, why center a book on this topic? So... Uh, almost exactly a year ago, we all got locked down. Um, I was in Joburg at a Yoko conference, uh, giving a keynote address there and opening the conference. And when we got back to Cape Town and got locked down, all of my talks dried up, all of my income dried up. And um, instead of sitting on my hands and panicking, I decided to be more proactive. And I thought to myself, in 20 years, what have I learned that I can help other people do? And I've realized that I'm a starter. I'm not going to take a business to a billion dollars and 10,000 employees. That doesn't interest me. What interests me is starting things. And I've built methods uh, in my mindset, my lifestyle. Uh, throughout this book, I talk about these things that help me build things from zero to one. So that's why I wrote this book, because I've come to understand from lots of coaching that I've done, lots of consulting that I've done, that what people struggle with is the first step. They struggle with building their lives and structures to have a side hustle exist sustainably in their lives. And that word sustainably is the key. We're not trying to build a flash in the pan. This is an MLM. We're trying to do something that lasts forever. And to do that, I wanted to write a book to help people understand how I've come to understand this. Yeah. Hello, Cynthia. Hello, Dudley, Sean, Enoch, Rob, and everybody else uh, uh, joining us. But uh, you know, Nick, you're helping people launch side hustles through a, a fund called uh, Slow Fund. You're offering people money. Uh, you're also coaching them to start uh, a, side, a side hustle. Can you tell us more about the Slow Fund, please? Yes. So I've always wanted to have a fund. Um, having been building businesses since I was 16, the natural progression for me is to help other people build businesses. Um, and I was going to do this in 2022. But with the book coming out, I decided that a very smart, logical way to help people um, put my money where their mouths are is to start giving money away. Um, so I had the idea to launch a fund called the Slow Fund, where every single day for a year, starting on the 15th of February, I'm giving a thousand rand away to a side hustle um, 
that applies to the fund. We're also giving away 30 minutes of coaching with me every single day for the next year. I'm coaching one new person. Yoko's come on board. They are giving away Yoko Go Machine to everybody who is eligible. And a company called Bridgement, bridgement.co.za, they've come on board to offer a once a quarter 20,000 Rand loan that um, is very soft terms to one of the side hustles that is eligible and qualifies to grow their business even further. Um, so that's what the Slow Fund does. As it stands today, we've had over 9,300 applications in less than a month, which is a staggering amount. Um, if I give away 10,000 Rand for every single startup, for every single day, I could do that for 2,736 years right now. Yeah. That is how many people want money. Yeah. So, so uh, Nick, uh, from the Slow Fund, has there has there been side hustles that have emerged and launched um, through the Slow Fund? And can you, can you talk tell us about the nature um, of those businesses? Because you know it, it's nice to hear about examples of you know s side hustles um, from what other people have done. Absolutely. Um, so first off, you can go to slowhustle.org if you want to apply or if you want to contribute. Um, we are taking contributions. So please, 1,000 Rand gets you to help start a th one business. So yeah, we've had some very cool businesses. Um, the most fun one that I've, I've coached so far is um, a lady called Nobukle who lives in Joburg and she took her 350 Rand COVID grant uh, in the middle of COVID and started a side hustle making jams and chili sauces. She'd never done this before. She literally went onto Google and said, how to make a chili sauce, took the three most popular recipes she could find, turned them into a chili sauce, and has rolled that into a business that is sustaining her life right now. So the thousand rand that she's gotten from us is going towards barcodes and labels so that she can actually expand her store footprint and go and start selling her stuff in stores. So we do have some really brilliant people doing some really cool things. And what I like about the side hustles we're getting is they're just normal people doing normal things. They're not life-changing, innovative ideas. That's not what side hustles are about. Side hustles are having an idea and getting to revenue because an idea without a revenue stream is just a hobby. We're not talking about hobbies here. We're talking about side hustles. Yeah. And also that example, doesn't it illustrate or underscore that side hustles can be small and you don't have to go big. You don't have to scale up very fast a side hustle should not consume much of your time um but but you can start small basically is what i'm saying hey definitely and uh, i would say that that's actually the most pertinent thing here is when people start off with an idea and i've seen this a million times i've seen this in my own family um ideas are not special your idea is not unique but what we do when we have ideas is we hold it close to our chest and we make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And we think, oh, if I can launch it, I'm going to be rich. There's going to be a billion people who use it. I'm going to change the world. And then you get so overwhelmed by the size of this idea that you'd never do it. We all know that saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that is what we're talking about with these side hustles is just do things that don't scale. Do a business that sells cakes and sell 10 cakes and then sell 50 cakes. And when you've sold 50 cakes, hire a person to help you sell 100 cakes. And over a period of five years, you'll have a sustainable business that sends you on a holiday once a year. That's cool. You don't need a business that changes the world. You need a business that gives you enough. Strive for enough. Yeah. Hey, Nick, I mean, one of the things you write about in the book is that fear gets in the way of people doing things. I hate fear. I'm scared of fear. I think it's ego crushing. It's soul destroying. And getting up and trying again is, is often very difficult. Um, but you also had a side hustle that you launched um, during the, the, the lockdown, and that also failed. Um, can you maybe help you know, our audience, uh, you know, help us reflect uh, through you and your failures, um, especially when it comes to this particular side hustle that failed? Because you like embracing failure, and you say embracing yeah. failure is important, right? Yes. So, I mean, there's so much to unpack here. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, I, I often laugh at people who only talk about their successes because you can't have success without failure. It's impossible. I've never met anybody who succeeded without having failed first. So what I like to tell people to remember, and if you are watching this now, please write this down, use it as a mantra. Failure is not fatal. It's not. And if it is fatal, you should probably be doing something else. Like that's a really simple rule for life. If the thing you're doing might kill you, don't do it. If it's not going to kill you, it's not fatal. Go forth, do it, embrace it, learn from failures. Failure is not an end point. It's a through point. It's something you have to embrace so that you can learn lessons. And that's exactly what I did.
when my speaking gigs were all canceled last year, um, I decided to start a side hustle called Remote Keynotes, where you could book a remote keynote speaker to do a gig online like we're doing right now. I built the website in two weeks with a partner. We got it up and running. I recruited some of the biggest speakers globally, as well as South Africa. And three months in, not a single person had booked a gig. So shockingly, Ray, I closed it down. And you know what happened? Nothing. Yeah. Nobody cared. Nobody commented. The speakers emailed me and said, oh, dude, well done. Thanks for trying. Good work. Nobody is watching you fail. You think they are. But here's the insight, the trick that I've learned. People are so scared of their own failures. They're watching their own failures that they're not waiting for you to fail. They're waiting for you to succeed. And if the people around you, you genuinely believe are waiting for you to fail, you need to get rid of them. You need to move on from those people. The people in your life should be additive, not subtractive. They should be positive, not negative. And if the people around you are waiting for you to fail, you need to rethink them. Yeah. I mean, um, Mikhail, I'm sorry if I... I love uh, that. I'm, I'm, I'm butchering your, your name, but... And he or she says, uh, fail, F-A-I-L, first attempt in learning. So, um, Perfect. You know, I'm going to steal yeah. that, Mikhail. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello, Paresh. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Renee, Ross, and Sharda. But we had a question from uh, submitted uh, by Daily Maverick Reader, assume earlier. And this person says, not all, not all people have the entrepreneurial characteristics or the grit for this vocation. I assume this person refers to mm. entrepreneurship. It's sometimes healthy to acknowledge your own strengths, strengths and weaknesses so that you don't waste uh, your time on your weaknesses, but rather focus on your strengths. When do you call it a day on an entrepreneurial um, outing? In fact, I think you, you, in the book you refer to something you call a, a failure trigger. Failure triggers, yeah. Failure triggers and knowing when to walk away. So when do you know when to walk away next? There's actually so much to unpack in that question. Uh, firstly, you're right. Not everybody's an entrepreneur, but not every side hustle needs to be an entrepreneurial endeavor. If you're taking your savings and putting them into stocks, an ETF that is stable, low risk, but it gives you a dividend every year, there you've got a side hustle. It's generating income on top of your existing income stream. This is how wealthy people become and stay wealthy. They use their money to buy assets that give them more income. They don't use their money to spend on stuff that just devalues. So yeah. you don't have to be an entrepreneur to have a side hustle. How do you know when to walk away is a brilliant question and one that nobody ever thinks about. So I like to tell people, and I talk about it in the book, you need to do two things when you start. Set your success triggers and your failure triggers. And let's talk about failure triggers. They could be anything that triggers you to understand that you are on the verge of failing. And when you hit those failure triggers, you need to be disciplined to stop and reassess what you're doing. And a failure trigger could be anything. I like to use the example of walking your dogs. I have two dogs. I love to walk them. And one of my success triggers is I want to walk my dogs every day in the week. The failure trigger to that is if you can't walk your dogs for six days in a row, you need to stop and assess if your side hustle is additive or subtractive. So you need to actually look at failure and go, what does it look like for me? Because a lot of us don't do that. And then what happens is you marry your idea and you never get divorced. It's okay to divorce your idea. It is actually completely acceptable to walk away. One of my nickisms in life, uh, one of my 10 nickisms is sometimes you have to burn it all down. And that's true. Sometimes things fail and you have to burn them down and start again. So don't be shy of failure. This is the problem, right? If you are nervous of failure, you think you only have one shot. And when that one shot's over, you shy away and you walk off. But if you believe failure is part of the process to getting to success, you should be seeking those failures and going towards them. And then eventually you'll find out what your groove is and you'll succeed. Yeah, people are absolutely agreeing with you in the comment section, uh, you know, Nick, about embracing uh, failure. So something I don't see in many books about entrepreneurship, uh, Nick, that you write about quite extensively is you implore entrepreneurs to be mindful of their mental and physical well-being as well. Um, because often society tells us, you know, it's okay to sacrifice sleep as an entrepreneur. It's, a, it's okay not to have a quality of life and not spend time with your family and actually redirect that time to building your business. Um, you know, that's, you say that's quite dangerous. I just wonder, why, why did you focus particularly on mental and physical well-being uh, and, and dedicate such a large portion of that topic in the book? Yeah, an interesting story on this is um, when I first submitted the copy to my publishers, they um, actually responded and said to me, um, did you notice that the first 50% of your book doesn't talk about business? 
And I responded and said, yes, I'm very aware of that. Maybe I should explain it. So I had to write an intro explaining why. And the truth is, I've got lots of experience on why you need to have your mental and physical health right so that you can build the business. And the phrase I like to use is you need to build the life you need for the side hustle that you want. And we, if you aren't mentally fit, if you're not physically fit, if your relationships are up the, the toilet, then the chances are at some point, you're going to have to choose between your mental health and your side hustle or your physical health and your side hustle or your partner and your side hustle. And you know what you're going to choose. You're going to choose everything but your side hustle, which means there is no sustainable way to build a side hustle unless you have your mental, physical health in check. And I promise you now, the best thing I ever did was understand that I needed a psychologist, that I needed people around me who supported me, because without that, you're alone. And being somebody building something like this on your own, trust me, it's hard enough doing it, whether you do and doing it on your own is just impossible. Yeah. Well, Nick is about to treat us to a reading. I've asked him to grab a copy of his book um, because he was, he, I mean, he also compromised his health working insanely hard. Um, he had a health scare. And I'd like to, me and Nick to read, uh, do a bit of reading for us. Uh, Nick, on page 39. Um, it's, it's quite a scary, but also um, I think there's a lot of lessons to be to draw from this experience um, that you went through. Sure thing. If you neglect your mental and physical fitness, you will become unhealthy and a mentally unstable jerk. Hell, you might be a mentally unstable jerk already, and let me tell you for free that no one wants to work with that person. I should know, because I've been down that dark road of self-sacrifice in the name of building a business. I was building a startup in 2010 that was a disruptive technology business. My partner and I had raised a round of funding to build the business, and we moved to Cape Town to do so closer to our investors. I left my support structure behind and worked myself to sickness, literally. One night I was woken up by a shooting pain in my stomach and couldn't get back to sleep. The pain became so intense that I decided I should probably get to the hospital. I didn't have anyone around me to help me, so I dragged myself into my car and drove myself to the hospital. I arrived, parked, and stumbled into the emergency room at about 3 a.m. I was given strong drugs to ease the pain. Luckily, before they decided to operate on me, my partner arrived from Johannesburg and took me for a second opinion. I had a ruptured stomach ulcer caused by stress and some random medication I was taking to help myself avoid getting flu. I worked myself into the emergency room alone, in pain, and with nothing but my work to show for it. I was useless for a few weeks after that as I recovered. The more damage you inflict on yourself, the less valuable you become to others. It's really that simple. Preparing yourself mentally for the journey you are able to take is key. And you also write, it's okay to take, take some time off. It's okay if you can't find the time this week or next week. It's okay to defer, uh, you know, the, the to-do list. It's okay to be human. Yeah. It's okay to go on holiday. Um, because, Nick, to be honest, we are made to feel bad for doing all of those things, going on holiday and not working. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a corporate creation to make us work like robots. And I mean that literally, like robots in a warehouse. We're not robots. And it's not only okay to take time off, scientifically, it has been proven that if you give your brain time to rest, you will come back at problems orders of magnitude more effective. If you are coding or working at 4 a.m. and you think that you're working at your best, let me be the first to tell you you're wrong. You think you're special, you're not. You think you only need three hours of sleep, you don't. There are very few human beings in the world who can survive on three hours of sleep, and you are not one of them. I'm not one of them. I need a good eight hours of sleep. I am in bed and sleeping by 9.30 every night, and I'm up at 5.30 every morning. The world belongs to those people who get eight hours of sleep and wake up early. Sure. That's, that's remarkable. Um, let's, I, I wish you could help Arlene here and um, help Kate. Um, he or she says, so enlightening, about to be retrenched. Um, and this is so inspiring for me. I assume that, you know, Eileen is about to, you know, embark on launching a, a, a side hustle. But can we talk about the principle of Ikigai? I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly as a starting yeah. point. Um, you know, when you have that idea and want to pursue um, launching a side hustle. Um, yes. Let's talk about this, Nick. You can better explain yeah. the Ikigai principle for us. <laughs> Of course. Um, so the Japanese concept of Ikigai is really uh, the simplest translation is your reason for being. Now, that can be dangerous. And I'm in no way suggesting that you should find your reason for being and turn it into a side hustle. 
But there was a really cool graphic in the book, um, that kind of a, a Venn diagram of things you should mesh together to figure this out. And you've got to start thinking about what you're good at, what the world needs, what you can get paid for, and what you love. And somewhere in there, you're going to find things that you're good enough at to turn into a side hustle. And it doesn't have to be your vocation. It can just be something you're really good at that the world needs. That's cool. Turn that into a side hustle, make money. It can be something you love that you can get paid for. That's cool too. Turn that into something that you can make money from. The goal here is to, with little effort and existing skill, turn something into something that makes you money. That's it. It doesn't have to be so complicated. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, you, you sectioned the book, you know, we started to talk about me mental health, um, but also lifestyle adjustments, Nick. Um, I just want to read you a portion, something you say on page 54. Uh, you say starting a side hustle is going to take time away from things that you are already trying to fit in, like exercise, sleep, relationships, work, reading, um, hobbies, children, dance, learning, personal uh, learning, personal development, and literally anything else you have uh, punishing yourself for not doing, um, you know, often enough. Yep. Nick, it feels like I'm going to sacrifice a lot when I, <laughs> when I decide to start a, a, you know, a side hustle. It feels like there's a lot of things I'm giving up. Um, you know, in the pursuit of a side hustle. Is this correct about my lifestyle is going to have to change? I'm going to have to adjust my lifestyle to accommodate this new love called um, a side hustle. Yeah, absolutely. In the same way that you have to adjust your life if you have a new kid. Mm -hmm. Like you can't expect to have a newborn, newborn baby or side hustle and just let life carry on as is. Um, and this, op this often comes up when I coach people, when they come through my, my side hustle program, um, they tell me that they have a time problem. There's not enough time in the day. It's just not true. I have the same amount of hours as you have. You have a priority problem. You don't have a time problem. If everything in your life is important to you, then nothing is important to you. If everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. Literally, the word priority means something that is of top priority, something that is special. And if you have seven priorities, how do you get to them all? So in the book, I cover this um, in a variety of different ways, in a variety of different sections. One of my favorite things to ask people to do in my, my online program is do a time audit. Start on Monday and for every hour in your day for the next week, account for that hour, write it down and then review it. And I tell you now, right now, without knowing any of the 300 people in this audience, you all watch too much TV, me included. I'm part of that. We watch too much TV. We don't think we do, but we do. Even if it's an extra 40 minutes that you shouldn't be doing it, that's 40 minutes you need to reprioritize so you can fit something else in, whether it's exercise or your new side hustle or your kids. Just figure out what your priorities are and be vicious about them. You can't have everything work for you all the time. Something's got to give. And it's that doom scrolling, fake highlight real life of social media that makes us think that everybody's got to figure it out. Nobody does. What they're prioritizing is posting their beautiful life on social media. Most people I know who love their lives, they're not on social media. They're living, not posting. Yeah. Oh, Nick, I'm not sure about auditing my time or what I spend. <laughs> Once I find out, I'm going to be embarrassed because it's probably not going to be productive what I spend time on uh, doing. Yep. But uh, Tracy says, how many people make the mistake of starting a side hustle to make the shortfall in their current budget? Is this a good idea? You talk about this in the book about... If you want to start a side hustle because you are facing immediate cash flow problems, it's probably not a good idea to start a side yeah. hustle. Yeah. So, look, there are ways for you to start something and generate income from it really quickly. And for that, I like to tell people to pivot towards the skills that you have. Don't try and relearn something. It's going to take you at least a year to learn something, at least a year to get good at it, and then at least another year to earn money from it. So now you're looking at a three-year turnaround. Added to that, I like to tell people to please... Do not spend money you don't have starting a side hustle. There are ways that I go through in the book on how you can build a side hustle without spending your last cent. If you have no savings, please save first. Get yourself a six-month slush fund that if you get retrenched in the world we live in, you are going to get retrenched at some point. You need to diversify your income and you need to have savings so that you can have six months to set up the next thing that you're going to do. I am preaching a responsible, medium to long-term way to build extra income into your life. I've been doing it for 10 years. One of my side hustles has now become a main hustle. Speaking has paid for an overseas holiday for me once a year for 10 years. 
That's long-term view. I didn't start out that way. It took me 10 years to get to that point. So you do have to think long-term. You do have to save money. You need to be frugal. You can't just blow cash setting up a business. Um, and I actually saw in one of the chats, a guy asked me about the side hustle that um, I started that failed last year. And he said, didn't you spend money building all these things? Well, actually, no. I got a partner who could design web. I got a partner who could do code. Um, I found speakers who gave me their time and attention for free. And all I did was put in time. I allocated time. And let's be honest, while we were in lockdown, I had time. I couldn't exercise. I couldn't leave my house. I couldn't see my friends. So I had all this extra time. So yeah, I did spend my attention and my effort building this, not my money. Yeah, Mark asks this. I don't, I'm not sure how you're going to take it. <laughs> Nick, how, do you take chemical assistance to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, this this is really important, actually. No, um, I on occasion have taken a sleeping pill, all natural, but literally once or twice in my life. Um, I meditate almost every day. I um, don't don't watch too much TV. I do puzzles at night. I eat exceptionally healthy food. Uh, this year I've stopped eating sugar um, and especially before going to bed. All these things that we do, they contribute to you not sleeping. Uh, I have high anxiety just naturally. I'm a high stress person. That doesn't help me sleep, but meditation, exercise, all these things are methods that help your body understand that you need sleep. And it is genuinely the most important thing. You think you need pills. You think you need whatever. You need eight hours of sleep. That's what you need. You see why I call him an overachiever? <laughs> but here's the thing, Nick. Um, you, because I'm, I'm, still, I'm still in the starting a phase of launching a side hustle. You're not a fan of you know, business plans, but you do say it's important when you start to define what success and failure means to mm -hmm. you. And that will actually be your guiding goal when you uh, launch a, a side hustle. Why is it why is it important to know what success or failure means to you? I, I mean, I assume that it means different things to different people, right? That's the key, is yeah. we all believe that success is this inherently adopted understanding that's universal to everybody. And it's not. That is the greatest trick right now in the world, is we all believe that our success should look like somebody else's success. It's just fundamentally flawed. I have different skills to Ray. Ray has different skills to you in the audience. We all understand success in different ways. And if you've adopted my version of success and you're bleak that you don't have two books published, but you've never written a word in your life, of course you're going to be upset. Judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree and it will always feel like a failure. That's why it's important to ask yourself, what do I want? What is success? Is success 3,000 Rand a month to pay off my car? Is it 10,000 Rand a month? Is it my entire salary over three years so that I can leave the job that I hate? Great, write it down. And equally, failure triggers are so important because if you don't know what failure looks like to you, you will just bury yourself in this business and never walk away. But it's okay to walk away. You, if you've had one idea and you've built one side hustle, I promise you now you've got more. You, your one idea is not your best idea. In fact, your first idea is probably the one you need to get out of the way to find the good ideas in your brain. Sure. I'm going to jump. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, it's going to be a messy discussion. I'm going to go back and forth early in the book and, and go ahead um, uh, right in uh, the later chapters. of the Keep book. me on my toes, Ray. <laughs> but Elka asked this you know, question that you talk about quite in detail in the book. Um, he or she says, what have you found to be the best promotional marketing platform area for your side hustle, promotion, promoting your, your, your side hustle. Um, yeah. This is all about context um, and the context for me that is so important and I talk about in the book in great detail and I've only really started understanding in my own businesses in the last five years, who is your customer? Who are you selling to? Where are they? And the big mistake that a lot of people make is they say to me, my customer is a female from the ages of 18 to 65. Really? Literally, that's half the population. Where do you find that woman? Where, where is she? Is she on Instagram? Is she in malls? Is she at gym? No, you need to be more specific. And the phrase I want you guys to remember is niche does not mean small. Niche means specific. There is a huge difference here. In the world of the internet, niche could mean 100 million people who like pink fluffy slippers. That's where you have to start thinking is, what do they look like? Where do they eat? What do they wear? How often do they shop? How many kids do they have? You need to go as detailed as you can. Once you've figured that out, 
figuring out where you should be marketing becomes a breeze. We all default to Facebook. Why? Biggest growing group on Facebook is Silver Surfers, people over the age of 50. If you're not targeting people over the age of 50, why are you on Facebook? If you're targeting Instagram and you're looking for men over the age of 40, oof, you're in the wrong place. If you're targeting 18-year-olds and you're not on TikTok, what are you doing? So you need to understand who your audience is and then find the marketing platform that works for them. Yeah, a question tied to that that Andrew asks, um, is marketing research a big part um, of a side hustle, getting to know your market uh, and route to market as well? It's a big enough part, but I want to go to great pains here to emphasize that these things should not be roadblocks. Roadblocks are things we put in our way so that we can justify failure, so we can justify not succeeding. What you need to do is go back and remember what we spoke about in failure. Failure doesn't matter. Market research is great, but if you do it for seven months, you may as well just be a market research agency. What you need to do is enough market research that you have a sense of where you're going, who you're talking to, how you're targeting them, and then go out and sell. If you're not selling and no one wants to buy from you, no, no amount of market research can actually get you a proper business. So don't get obsessed with this. Remember, side hustles are things you're doing in extra time. So if you've only got an hour a week, take three weeks, spend three hours, do your market research and in week four, start selling to the people you think are your market. If they tell you that they don't want your product, either you're talking to the wrong people or you're selling the wrong product. And if it fails, move on. Um, as you say. If it fails, move on. You've got other ideas in your head. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 this is me being messy. I want to go back again uh, in the early uh, part of the book. Um, we are at the ideas phase now. I have an idea. Um, I, it's either I want to anchor my side hustle as a physical product that I'll sell or my service or something that I offer in the form of a service. What are the considerations when you are considering whether I, an idea is viable, whether there is a market for it, or whether it, it will even be successful. I'm not even sure you know at, at an idea space if your idea is going to be successful or not. Yeah, you have to ask yourself some really obvious, really simple, really stupid questions. Can I sell this? Can it make money? Who am I going to sell it to? And where are those people? And if your idea doesn't tick any of those boxes, either try and find answers to those questions that help you to tick those boxes or come up with another idea. And I read, I think it is important to focus in on this idea thing. We're all so obsessed with ideas. Some of the smartest, wealthiest, successful people I know do the stupidest stuff like retread tires or sell drinks or import plastic. You don't have to have an innovative world-changing idea. Just do something that can make money. For a side hustle, your idea needs to make money. If it isn't making money, it's just a hobby. And you don't want to spend all your waking hours on a hobby that will never make you money. So you have to be quite honest about this with yourself. Can it make money? That's the key thing to ask about your idea. And also an idea when you when you launch a business, um, there isn't already, in most cases, a, a business that is that exists that you know that offers similar you know products or services that you're about to launch. Um, you know, it's it's not about, you know trying to change a market, you're working within an, an existing market with existing dynamics mm. here. Uh, is, is that my, my thinking yeah. correct? Uh, yeah, look, there's, there's some key points on this. Um, one, if there is no one in your market, there's no competitors, no one's doing this, you should be asking yourself why. Because none of my ideas have been new. None of my ideas have been unique. I've always gone into markets where someone is already doing it. And what I've done is ask myself, can I do it better, faster or cheaper? And if you can do it better, faster, or cheaper, go do it. Go to their customers, tell them you can do it better, faster, or cheaper, and then sell to them. So that's the one thing is if there's no one in your market, be worried because your idea is probably not that unique and good. And establishing a new industry is way harder than entering an existing one and offering a service at a better price. Second thing is if there is competition, start analyzing them, be ruthless, figure out where their customers are and go sell to them, figure out how much they cost, where they're selling to, who they're selling to. All of those things are valuable insights for what you're building. Don't be shy of competition. If you think you can do it better, go do it better. Yeah. I think the last time we spoke, uh, Nick, when your book was still in an online uh, format, I think I told you about this. I was surprised that you, 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 you implore people to not um, you know, anchor their side hustles around their passions as well, because often we hear that your, your business should be your passion. You should build your business around your passion. 
I think it speaks to Cynthia's point, um, who says, but surely you want to enjoy it too. I, I assume that's what she, he or she means. Yeah. Like, has to be a side hustle. Um, I wouldn't want it to be boring. So so it's, it's a bad yeah. idea to anchor your passion um, around a side hustle. Discuss for 10 marks, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is the advice, shockingly, that I get the most um, admin about. I get criticized for this advice a lot from everyone, people who interview me on podcasts, everyone. And I have a really simple theory. Um, the book is, for me, a philosophy on living with a side hustle. That philosophy involves enjoyment of things that you're good at, that you like to do. So if you like to create pottery and it's a hobby of yours, I promise you now that if you try and sell that pottery and it doesn't work, you will give up doing pottery. Because you'll start believing you're not good at it, or you will succeed at it, and then it will become a chore and a job. And now the things that give you mental health, that give you physical um, enjoyment of your life, have become a chore and a job. So there's a phrase that you need to take away from this. You shouldn't turn your passion into your side hustle, but you should be passionate about the side hustle you are building. There is a subtle but important difference. Your passions are things that fill you with ethos, with pathos, with life. The things that you are passionate about like organization, if you're really organized, that's not a passion of yours. You're just really passionate about being organized. Then become a virtual assistant. If you're OCD and you like cleaning, go clean people's garages and see if they'll pay you 500 bucks to clean out their garages. It's not your passion, but you are passionate about it. And I think that there is an important difference that people conflate too often. Mm -hmm. uh, Felicity asks uh, quite a personal question. Um, as an introvert, um, how do you start? Um, Wow. Yep. I think I, um, as much as I'm an extrovert here, I think I'm an ambivert. So there are times when I want to just crawl into a hole and not speak to anybody ever. Um, but I think that the advent of the internet has made life um, exceptionally profitable for introverts. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you should be pivoting towards your skills. So if you're an introvert and you don't like talking to people face to face, but you do like helping people book flights, become a virtual assistant. If you're an introvert and you can only cope with one-on-one -on -one engagements and you can speak multiple languages, teach one person a week to speak a language that you can speak. There are lots of options. However, we are trained in society to not believe that the things we are good at are valuable. We are trained to believe that the things other people are good at are valuable. So again, pivot towards the things you're good at and see if there's a way you can exploit them to make yourself money, whether you're an introvert or an expert. Let's be honest, the pandemic world we live in is built for introverts. Introverts should be thriving in this world where you don't have to go out, where it's actually bad to go out and talk to people. Now's the time to double down. Yeah, I think we're all actually, you know, rediscovering that if you thought you're an extrovert, you actually are an introvert. And, you know, opposite with, you know, if you're an introvert, yep. you are actually an extrovert. And um, a lot of questions about social media. Um, mm. so talk about from Cheryl, how do you find out uh, which age group um, is using which social platform? Again, yeah. target audience appropriately. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's not my area of expertise, but just, just Google. Uh, genuinely, just do some Googling and you will find lots and lots of companies that will sell you data or give you data for free if you give them your email or something. Um, just be curious about all these questions and start finding these answers because they're out there. But yeah, that's what my suggestion is. I know these things off the top of my head because it's part of my job to understand who I'm targeting and when. So I can tell you that if you're younger than 18, you're on Snapchat or TikTok. Yeah, yeah. I want to go back to, you know, um, the lifestyle um, uh, section of the book. You also invest a lot of time talking about having a support system, to, you know, that, that's there to support you, whether it's your, you know, your family, your life partner. Uh, you know, how important is the support um, when you're about to, you know, go on the, the journey of launching a side hustle? Um, I, I guess having a safety net is quite important, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think I was going to say that it's unequivocally the most important thing, but you can't say that without tying it to your mental and physical health. So your mental and physical health being good means that your relationships will be better. And if those three things work well together, it's likely that you're going to be in a better position to build this side hustle out. So it's important to understand that the people in your lives need to contribute to this. And if they don't, they're either holding you back or you're crazy and you can't build the side hustle. So you need to be careful of whose advice you're taking in, who you're listening to. But 
if you one day have to choose between your best friend and your side hustle, as I've said before, you're going to choose your best friend because you believe they should be in your life. So it's important that you communicate with them. Tell them how much time it's going to take you every week, what they're going to miss out on. Sorry, buddy, I can't see you for a beer on Friday evenings because I have to go and hang out with my kids so I can build my side hustle on a Saturday. That's on you if they don't understand this is an issue and then they leave you in a huff. That's because you aren't communicating properly. So do them the service and tell them what you have planned. Tell them how much it's going to take and then ask them if they want to be involved, if they think it can work. Just get them to be part of the journey. Don't isolate people. Yeah. Uh, Rory says, um, have just started a small business in a tough environment in Barnes tourism. I cannot imagine, you know, the, the tourism sector has been decimated and during the lockdown. Yeah. And the obvious impact of the travel bans have been detrimental to any incumbent operation. What would your advice be um, in positioning a new brand operation in this kind of a space? I think this is not, maybe not a side hustle, but a, a main hustle. <laughs> sure. Um, look, it's a very tough one right now because of the uh, known unknown. None of us know when travel is going to open up. And when that does happen, none of us knows what that's going to look like. And none of us know what the incumbents are going to do to survive or thrive. So um, my suggestion here is to survive. Uh, Paul Graham is one of the world's most prolific investors. He started a fund called Y Combinator. He's one of the early incubators of Airbnb. And he tells people, he's got a great essay called Die. And he tells the story of how all you need to do is outlast your competitors, is survive. So in the travel industry, that has generally been my advice to people is, if you can figure out a way to survive until this is over, it's likely 90% of your competitors wouldn't have survived. So you will already be in a better position. So hunker down, cut costs, figure out what you can do with your existing client base to eke some value for them, and then keep going until travel opens up. That is very soft, vague advice, but it's the best I can do in travel. It's hard. Yeah. So we've talked about, you know, mental, physical well-being. We talked about, you know, uh, your approach to, you know, refining your idea, your side hustle idea. Uh, you've spoken to friends and family. You've tested out, you know, the idea, if, if it's viable and, and if there's a market uh, for it out there. Um, but, you know, the concept of minimum viable product and minimum desirable uh, product, uh, can you please talk us through that, the, the distinction between the two? I think it's quite important. Yeah, uh, yeah so um, MVPs are very common startup methodology of building businesses, minimum viable products. It was written in um, a book by Eric Reese called The Lean Startup. If you're building a big startup, go read that book. It's a great book. Buy mine first, but read his second. Um, and that is a feature-based way of doing this, right? What is the minimum version of your feature sets that you can launch into the world that is practically useful, that requires the least amount of effort and money to get off the ground and get people testing? The reason this methodology was invented is really simple. Most people, and if you're listening to this, think about your idea in your head. Most people want the perfect version of their idea before they put it out into the world. Unfortunately, that is a flawed method of building. That means you're going to spend three years, lots of money, lots of time, lots of effort, putting this product out into the world that nobody has used or tested. So MVP is a method to get your most basic version live so the most people in the world can test it and give you feedback. The next iteration of that is an MDP, a minimum desirable product, and that is customer focused, not feature focused. And the simple version of this is what features would your customers buy from you? Not what features are the least trouble for you to build. And you have to understand which features your customers will spend money on, want to use, and help you want to build. So that's the subtle difference. The one is feature-based and the one is customer-based. Both are important and one gets the other, but it's really relevant to not get perfect. Perfect is perilous. Perfect will end you in trouble. You cannot strive for perfection. It doesn't exist. Yeah. I want to go back to ideas. There's something that I forgot to ask you, Nick, about ideas and and coming up with ideas. Um, you say in the book, Google is not your friend. <laughs> so you sit in Google an idea. You, 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 you come up with an idea as you go out there in the world and interact with the world um, uh, as well. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a phrase you use, the empty room um, theory um, as mm. well. Um, but basically, ideas don't just come from you sitting and doing nothing. You have to go out there in the world and interact with the world. Right? Yep, spot on. So let's um, let's start with why Google is not your friend. Um, yeah. If you are on this call and you want to build a side hustle, I'm almost certain that you have typed the following sentence into Google. 
best side hustle ideas 2021. How do I know that? Because I buy ads to promote my product to you when you search for those words. And these are the most searched terms globally around side hustle. And I pay for ads on all of them. How to start a side hustle, best side hustle ideas, top side hustle ideas. And when you get results from Google, let me explain what happens. You see the top 10 results that everybody in the world who searches those terms sees too. So you are basically searching for the most popular ideas in the world, which is great because it means there's an industry for it, but it also means there are hundreds of thousands of competitors to you coming up in the world. So why I tell people to shy away from Google is because Google doesn't know what your skill sets are. Google doesn't know anything about you. They know where you are kind of, but they're not giving you ideas for South Africa. So what you have to do is get out into the world. I call this my empty room theory. You cannot sit in an empty room with no doors, no windows behind a computer and Google your way to an idea. Go out and live, go out and experience problems, go out and talk to your friends, go out and have dinners and find out what bugs them, find out what bugs you and then solve those problems. It might take you a little bit longer, but it's likely that you will pivot towards the things you're good at and solve problems you know how to solve. Google's gonna present you with the people who are buying the best ads and buying the best articles so that you can go and use their products. Don't do that. Can we use your example? Um, I mean, you owned a fashion brand recently and uh, you know, discovering this idea, you were at an airport after a holiday and you're just randomly walking around um, um, the airport. I'm not sure why I'm telling the story because you should tell the story. No, I'll tie it in. I'll tie it in. It, it makes sense. So um, I, the, the end result of discovering this um, fashion brand in an airport in Italy was actually uh, caused by a problem that I have. And the problem that I had when I started Nakari was men's fashion is boring. And I'm really tired of wearing black things. I'm wearing black right now. Um, right. So I know, I know it's terrible. Uh, black to my color. It goes with my beard. Um, but the problem was men's clothing was boring and especially in South Africa. And then in Italy, I realized that there were these brands punting bright underwear and bright clothing and crazy designs. And South Africa is three to five years behind the rest of Europe when it comes to fashion. So I got on a plane, discussed the idea with the people I was sitting next to who were my friends. When we landed, I started building the business. And that was it. I got out into the world. I was experiencing my problem and I saw a solution. I was never going to come up with that with Google. Never. Yeah, yeah. The last chapter of the book is called Hustle, doing the actual work and starting mm. the science hustle. But uh, Cheryl segues us in nicely into the, into the chapter because you talk about this, you write about this. Um, he or she says, uh, what are the legal and tax implications with regards to side hustle? Do I have to register a company? What about a VAT? Uh, do I have to pay tax on my side hustle? How often and how much? Yep. So these are all really great little roadblocks that we put in place so that we don't have to start our businesses. So the short answer is no. No, you don't have to start a business. Yes, you do have to pay tax. No, you don't have to register a company. No, you don't need a good logo. No, you don't need a business plan. All of those things are just roadblocks. If you start a company, you can be a sole proprietor. You get taxed under your regular income tax bracket. You have to submit um, that through a normal accountant. They will do it for you. Your current accountant can do it for you. If you are doing your accounting yourself, I urge you to spend 400 Rand and get someone else to do it. I've never done it in my life. Um, so these are roadblocks. Don't let these get in your way. You, you can trade as a sole proprietor. You can use zero xero.com if you want to spend a little bit of money on this. They will send out invoices for you. Or Go into Google Docs and for free, you've got invoice templates that you can put your name in and send it to people. And you don't put that on it because you're not that registered. You only have to register for that if you're doing more than a million rand a year in turnover. If you're doing less than that and hopefully your side hustle is because it just carries on flying under the radar, then you're golden. Just go out and sell. Don't worry about the technicalities. Yeah. Monday, Pat asks a question, something we've touched on earlier, um, you know, uh, uh, the difference between a product and a service. Um, it seems uh, like you're talking uh, product focus, uh, I, I assume side hustle, that are salient yep. differences in, a, are there salient differences in, a, in an approach yep. between a product-based side hustle and a service-based uh, side yep. hustle? Fundamentally not. Um, what we need to do is stick to my mantra here and pivot towards what you're good at. If you've never sold a product in your life and you know how to sell services, Go out and sell services, kinds of services that I think in my head that I always think of when I think of side hustles. One of my side hustles right now is business coaching. 
So I've got five or six clients every month that I coach. That's a service. I've priced myself into the market. I go out and talk about it occasionally. Great. Another service is teaching people to speak a language. Online for last year, part of my COVID experience was le- relearning my Greek and upping my Greek skills. So once a week, I had a Greek teacher for 30 minutes who would Skype me and we'd talk Greek. Those are service-based businesses. There are massive areas in the world where you can go to discover service-based suppliers or become one. Places like Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com, or Upwork. If you're a designer, if you want to do voiceovers um, for podcasts, if you want to do book recording, there's so many options that it's incredible. You're only limited by your curiosity. Yeah. Deidre is talking about opportunities here. Is there still a space for selling physical products in the SA, given the dominance of e-commerce sites like TakeLot? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, you could sell through TakeLot. TakeLot has got an ability for you to list your own products on there and sell to their audience. But niche is the place. You don't. TakeLot didn't start as a big billion rand business. TakeLot started as Take2.co.za more than a decade ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, selling niche products. Everyone who was Amazon started selling books, not Kindle books, actual books. And they did that for 10 years. They had seven years, their head start on everybody. So go niche, go specific, find your audience, figure out what they want, and then scale over time. Forget about take a lot. They're giving you anxiety that you don't need. All you need is a hundred customers paying you a hundred rand every month. Then you've got a real business. I want to, we've left you 10 minutes. I want to like, you know, us to work through the last chapter of the book. So we talked about success and failure triggers we talked about defining success and failure and embracing failure and you know changing your approach uh, to thinking about a failure mm. why are you so against writing a business plan like, you like reinventing the script here you flip <laughs> the script over because often yeah. years are told write a business plan right write reams and reams of pages you know about your idea why are you yep. anti- <laughs> So I'll give you some personal stories here. Um, I am not formally trained in business at all, ever. I did a journalism, politics, and philosophy degree. Um, I don't understand the value of writing about business. I understand the value of selling things. So as a side hustle person, your business plan is a waste of your time. Your time should be spent in the selling, in the customers, in the product, in understanding how you move your product from your storeroom to your customer's house. That's the game. So what you should be doing, if you absolutely must insist on writing a business plan, please just answer these three questions in a doc that is a living doc, like a Google doc. What are you selling? Who are you selling to? Where do you find them? Then put that away and go and find those people and sell to them. Because the key thing about a side hustle is selling, making money, not writing a business plan. Nobody gives you money for writing a business plan. And if you say to me, oh, but that's how you raise venture capital. No, that's not. That was how you raised venture capital 20 years ago. Trust me, I tried. Today, you raise capital off sales, off actual traction, off real business things. Business plans are for MBAs who don't know how to build businesses, who write them so that they don't have to go out and sell. I like to sell. You've just trashed the whole MBA community, Nick. (laughs) Well, I mean, don't worry. They're going to contact me and tell me they've got MBAs, so it's fine. (laughs) like uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. Um, Why is that? So uh, as an investor and a builder, I find NDAs insulting. Uh, NDAs, this is how it plays out for me. People will contact me and say, Nick, I'd love to pick your brain. Firstly, please don't email me and tell me that you want to pick my brain. It's a little bit condescending. Then they say, let's meet for coffee. And then when we meet for coffee, they present me with an NDA and say that we can't talk until I've signed that NDA. So number one, I've had your idea. Ray's had your idea. Everybody in this audience has had your idea. Your idea is not unique. I guarantee it. What you're telling me with an NDA is you don't trust me. You trust me enough for me to give you free advice, but you don't trust me enough to tell me your idea. That's an insult. So forget about the NDAs. If someone wants to steal your idea, let them. It'll light a fire under your ass so that you can go and build the idea. Competition is a good thing. You need motivation. And if your idea is so easy to steal that an NDA should protect you, it's probably not a good idea. Yeah. Let's power through the, the, the questions that are remaining because we've got eight minutes left. Uh, Cheryl, you've been very proactive. Thank you so much and very interactive, you know, abusing Nick here, which I love. Um, I appreciate it. Cheryl asks, how much uh, can promos increase sales uh, long-term and short-term promotions? Do they ideally yeah, it's, have a, a, it's a difficult one. Yeah. yeah, it's a difficult one. You've got to be careful not to discount the value of your product because if you over promote and over discount, then people come to expect that discounted price as the value of your product. 
So when it comes to pricing, you must remember that it's very easy to drop a price over time. It's very hard to lift the price over time. You have to grandfather your stock, your customers into the price raise. So be careful not to discount too deeply and too heavily and too often. At Nick Harry, when we had the stock company, we would often rebel against that. And when everybody in the mall was discounting, we'd increase our prices for the week um, just because we, you don't want to run in that direction. But they can be valuable um, as long as it doesn't become your norm. Yeah, Bianca, book ordered, can't wait, so inspiring. Yes, please buy the book Thank and you. read it. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, valuable tips uh, that Nick offers. Uh, but my favorite part of the book, uh, you know, one that we should be hearing a lot, Nick, especially entrepreneurs, is that friends and families should pay the full price. No special yeah. favor for family and friends. Uh, can you talk about this, please? This is one of my favorite acronyms in the book. Um, so the acronym is FPFP, Friends Pay Full Price. And it's really simple. We've spoken about the kinds of people you should have in your life. And that plays out into the kinds of people who take advantage of you when you start selling. And we've all had it. You launch a new business and your friends say to you, oh, that's great. I'd love to buy from you. But could you give me 50% off? That unequivocally is the wrong way to go. If you are already discounting to people who care about you, then maybe your product isn't good enough to sell. Maybe your price point is wrong. Maybe the people in your life just suck because your friends should be supporting you. They should be the ones paying you double so that you can get your business off the ground. Your family shouldn't haggle you for a discount. They should be telling their friends to pay full price. So don't start with discounting your friends. If you insist on doing it, tell them that you'll discount their fifth offer the fifth time they buy from you. Let them become recurring customers. Then you'll reward their loyalty. You don't get a free ride just because you know me. Yeah, it's going to create a lot of fights, eh? <laughs> Damn right. But Galen says, um, how important is routine and sticking sticking to it versus working when you have high energy? You speak about being, being consistent in the book. Um, if you fire off a newsletter every Tuesday uh, to your audience, you better stick to Tuesday and not Wednesday yeah. or any day of the week. Eh? So I'm going to quote Seth Godin here because he, he I can't say it better than him. Um, I like consistency and I, I like um, the idea of doing things repetitively. Seth Godin likes to say nobody has ever suffered from talking block. People suffer from writer's block all the time and they use it as an excuse to not be consistent. So when I was writing this book, the way that you do it is to write. The way that you build businesses is to build. You can't pause. You can't wait. You have to just do it and do it consistently. So routine is important. I completely agree with that. And I factor routine into my day heavily, but I also leave myself time to obsess. I leave myself time to be curious. I leave myself time to read and watch a YouTube video at lunch. So you have to build in the random spurts of creativity to your routine and make it part of your day. So like I said earlier, I wake up at 530 I exercise, I walk my dogs, and then I set myself an hour to read, to read anything, read philosophy that's 300 years old, to read anything to create my creativity. Mm. Uh, Mark is reflecting on our conversations uh, as we wind down. Uh, Mark says, for me, the most important thing Nick highlighted was no fearing failure. I tried it three times since 20, 2009, and finally in 2019, my side hustle hit the sweet spot. This has been very um, insightful and will uh, enhance my side hustle. So um, don't give up, basically. I awesome. guess that's what Mark is Yeah, saying. consistency. And I do talk about that a lot, right? Like your first idea is probably not going to work. Just be consistent. Yeah. Build another one. You've got lots of ideas. You're a smart person. And if you're even here, you're ambitious enough to be thinking about this. So go buy my book. Use it to help you springboard into your new side hustle. Yeah. Tell us about your 2030 goal and creating how many side hustles? People I want start. to create a million side hustles around the world by 2030 uh, in any form, whether you buy my book and you start one, whether you take my online program, whether you are in the slow fund, however I do it, I want to inspire a million people to understand that it's okay to just build a business that gives you enough. Just build your own side hustle, do something cool and fun and just start by building. Yeah. And imagine the multiplying effect of those side hustles yeah. grow, uh, you know, become bigger. Um, addressing the unemployment issue in the country uh, as well, so in the process. Um, is, the, is the book available on Kindle, someone asks? 
It is. Um, the book is available on Kindle. Just go to Amazon and search for How to Start a Side Hustle and you'll find me there um, globally too. You can buy it. Um, and I mean, Ray, if you don't mind at this point, I'm happy. Please, you guys find my website. Go to slowhustle.org to check out uh, the Slow Fund to see what we're doing at Slow Hustle and to find the book. And if you would like to sign up to my personal newsletter, I'm going to park the URL in there now. Uh, I send out a newsletter once a week with um, uh, uh, cognitive bias that I focus on every week that helps you understand why your brain is doing the things it's doing. Yeah, I'm pushing the envelope here and my bosses are going to be mad at me. But one last <laughs> very quickly, uh, DML asks um, how to get quick traction on your new website, getting traffic on your new website. Focus with friends, family, and fools. Tell them about it. Tell them to share it and then give them the best service you can give them. Don't be shy. Most of us are shy. We build things and we expect people just to appear. If you follow me anywhere, you'll know I'm not shy. I will tell you about my great book. I'll tell you about the products I'm selling. I'll tell you because you should know because I believe in what I'm doing. So if you believe in your product, tell people. That's the best way to gain traction. And on that point, Ray, if you are wanting to follow me anywhere, LinkedIn is a great place. Mm. Nick Haralambus, here's the book, How to Start a Side Hustle. It's been lovely. Um, thank you so much, Nick, as always. <laughs> thank you, Ray. This was so much fun. It's been lovely. Thank you so much, Nick. To everybody who's participated, thank you so much. Until the next one, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.